Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I will speak about K3 surfaces, um, mostly about geometry, but also about some arithmetic applications, uh, my primary interest in this subject. Um, so here are some examples. Um, a double cover of P2 ramified on the sextic curve, a quartic surface in P3, intersection of three quadrics, or uh, a Kummer surface, uh, resolution of singularities of an abelian surface quotient out by the standard involution x goes to minus x. These are all examples of K3s. Uh, <laughs> the fields I'm working over are mostly fields of arithmetic interest. Could be a finite field, or uh, the piatics, or the rationals, or a function field of a curve. And so the kind of questions that uh, uh, I study, uh, for example, uh, existence of rational points. I mean, you could look at adelic points, and then you could try to compute certain obstructions, the Brownian obstructions. So you'd want to compute some subset of the adels of unobstructed points. Well, how do you do it? How do you do it in theory? How do you do it in practice? Uh, we would also like to know about the density of rational points over non-closed fields, for example, of the rational numbers. And, uh, well, uh, we are interested in interactions between uh, rational curves, the geometric objects, and rational points, uh, more, much more arithmetic. Now, uh, first of all, we need to know about some geometric invariants. So we have the Picard group, uh, some lattice, intersection pairing. And, uh, well, the rank of that group is uh, from 1 to 20, if you work over fields of characteristic 0. Um, over FP bar, you could get up to 22. Now, uh, essential for geometry is the cone of effective curves, or ample divisors. Uh, and uh, in case of the three surfaces at hand, uh, it's clear what it is. So these are all classes that are uh, intersect positively polarizations that we fix and have square bigger or equal than minus 2. Now, that cone uh, governs a lot of the geometry. Uh, we can understand vibration structures for questions like density of rational points. We would like to know about elliptic vibrations. We're also interested in automorphisms. And uh, here is a standard example. If the Picard lattice represents uh, 0, then there is an elliptic vibration. And, uh, well, if you look at automorphisms in rank Picard 1, it's only a finite set, and rank Picard 2, well, you can write down when the group of automorphisms is finite or not. Um, and uh, all of this is useful in arithmetic. Now, um, the, the key result uh, in the theory of K3 surfaces is the Torelli theorem that, uh, well, you have periods, you know, some numbers, and that if you have these numbers and, uh, uh, well, you can understand what kind of a K3 surface you have. In other words, if you have an isomorphism of lattices, preserving the polarizations and inducing inequality of periods, up to scalars, of course, you can rescale, then there is unique isomorphisms, isomorphism of K3s uh, inducing this uh, uh, isomorphism of lattices. And, uh, well, you use it to understand automorphisms, uh, you know, mapping from S to S. Uh, well, you, you have an extension of this theory from one polarization. You can look at lattice polarized case trees. That's also interesting and important. And, well, uh, these periods, you can make some contraction and relate a case 3 to a abelian variety of very high dimension. And that's also very useful because certainly you understand the geometry of abelian varieties you know, much better a priori than geometry of uh, arithmetic of uh, K3 surfaces, uh, but of course the price we have to pay is that the dimension is pretty large of that Kugus attack abelian variety. Now, so we have these invariants. How do we compute them in practice? Uh, so over FP bar, uh, well, you have to count points over finite fields, and you have to count points over FP, FP squared, up to FP to the 11, because you see the main piece there in the uh, data function is H2. H2 has you know, rank 22, as we saw. And, well, you have to go up to the middle, P to the 11. Well, if you count points naively, you have an equation, a quartic in P3. So you have to plug in for x, y, z, t, you know, some numbers, you know, coordinates in FP. So a priori, it's uh, the number of points in your finite field to the force, right? So if you go up to P to the 11th and then to the force, it's very large. So in practice, if you do this, you can only handle small primes. 
So for example, primes less than 10. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, that's okay if you are interested in, you know, K3 over F2 or F3, but not okay otherwise. So over F, over Q bar, over a number field, uh, well, there is an ad hoc method. If you can compute uh, these ranks of uh, Picard groups over uh, FP bar for two different primes, and you also, you know, something about those lattices, then we know that over FP bar, the, the rank is even. So you can't get one, you, but you can get two. So if you happen to get two times two, you know, in two different primes, and those lattices don't uh, match, I mean, the discriminants are not differing by a square of a number, you can be lucky, it happens. Then you know that uh, Picard over uh, Q bar has to be Z, rank one. And so this uh, was a method that was implemented by Van, Van Luik, and so this produced first examples of K3 over Q with geometric Picard rank 1. All right. So, uh, well, this is practice. Well, how do we do it in theory? Uh, so here is a recent result. Uh, a K3 surface of degree 2, double cover of P2 ramified and a sextic over a number field. So you can compute uh, with a priori bounded running time uh, first of all, the Picard lattice, together with generators, so no explicit curves. Uh, also, the Brouwer group uh, that I mentioned, that you use in arithmetic applications, and also that kernel for the um, Brouwer, the Brouwer unobstructed adults. Uh, now, what is the method? I mean, uh, so let me start with, suppose we know the Picard group and all of that. Well, to compute the Brouwer group, uh, well, we just take, you know, random vibrations, I mean, just fiber over P1, fibers, you know, high genus curves, whatever happens, you know, just take hyperplane sections. And then uh, we use uh, sort of descent on those uh, curves, or rather the Jacobians of those curves. And then if you know that, you can construct explicitly some Atsumai algebra over the complement of the singular fibers in one vibration. Then you look at another vibration, you get it over the singular, outside the singular fibers of the other vibration, and they intersect in finitely many points, and then there is a something called purity. And you know, purity, and so then you can extend. You know there's a unique class that extends. So this is uh, quite messy, and the running times are a priori bounded, but huge. And, uh, well, it's a theoretical result, computable, but, you know, how do you do it? Now, to compute the Picard lattice, uh, we need some version of an effective version of the Kuga Sataka correspondence. Uh, well, so already we are ending up with a billion varieties of dimension, maybe two to the 19 or something like this. This is also not really practical. But uh, we'll have, we have to employ you know, all kinds of effective results in arithmetic geometry, Tate conjecture, GIT, and so on. Now, why degree 2? Why are we still stuck in degree 2? So the main issue is that we need an effective construction of the moduli space of polarized K3s. So I already mentioned, you know, there are periods, there's a period domain, there's a quotient by some discrete group. So here it is. Uh, and uh, we know by Bailey Borel that uh, this is a quasi-projective variety. You know, it sits in some projective space. We need to know uh, which projective space and some bound on degrees. And uh, that can be done in for K3s of degree 2, because we have uh, a result that uh, this particular quotient here is accessible via geometric invariance theory. I mean, it's essentially, you know, it's the plane sextics, right? You look at sextic curves, uh, you quotient by the corresponding group, and then you know that it's essentially this. Now, of course, for quartic K3s, again, it's GIT. You have a GIT construction of the moduli space, but it's not quite this space. There is some small discrepancy. And so what's needed there to you know, patch things up is to overcome the small discrepancy and get an effective uh, construction of this quotient. Of course, I believe that this is true in general. Um, it boils down to sort of effective generation for the ring of automorphic functions on this thing and, uh, you know, effect bounds on degrees of, the, of generators. And, uh, you know, it's accessible either by analysis. I mean, you can get it from analysis in principle. But so all the proofs we looked at uh, are, well, you have a comp compact thing. You have a continuous function on it. There are some bounds. And uh, that's just not good enough if you don't know the bounds really. Anyway, so that was a fun project to do. 
And so the Picard uh, lattice is computable. Now, uh, I already mentioned that over FP bar, you always have uh, you know, even rank for geometric Picard. Uh, and uh, well, over Q bar, it is what it is. So we'd like to understand the variation of uh, the geometric Picard rank as you go from prime to prime. Now, uh, all right, so we have the orthogonal to the Picard lattice, uh, that is called the transcendental lattice. And we can look at its endomorphism algebra. So it's either total real or a CM field. And uh, there is some a priori lower bound on the rank of the uh, Picard over you know, FP bar uh, in terms of, well, uh, first of all, what you have over Q bar that will survive naturally. But then there is sort of this extra piece. And uh, well, the extra piece is something. You know, it's some degree of his field extension or, or nothing. Uh, and uh, Francois Charles proved that equality here uh, will hold for infinitely many primes. So now let's look at the set of primes where we jump over what's expected. And let's call it the set of jumping primes. And uh, the main question is, uh, is this set infinite? And uh, of main interest uh, to us is uh, rank Picard 2. In rank Picard 1, we already know we are jumping. But in rank Picard 2, we may stay, or, uh, so we don't know. So, uh, so let's investigate this for Comer surface, even though for our applications, we need rank Picard 2. In case of Comer surfaces, of course, you'll keep uh, the Picard rank of the abelian surface that you started out with. But then the 16 fixed points that you have, you know, you blow them up, this adds 16 to the Picard lattice. So it's 16 plus whatever uh, Picard rank you had for the abelian surface. All right, so what kind of abelian surfaces can we have? You can have a product of two elliptic curves. Now, if you have that, then you're guaranteed to have rank Picard at least 18, because each elliptic curve will give you 1, 1 plus 1 plus 16. Now, if those curves happen to be isogenous, then already you're up to 19. And if, in addition, uh, you have complex multiplication, then you're up to 20. So this is what we have. So these are the options. And now, of course, you'll get 22 if uh, you have super singular reduction. So uh, now, super singular reduction, how often does this happen? Noam Elke has proved in 87 that uh, there are actually infinitely many uh, such primes where you acquire super singular reduction. So his original paper was over Q. You know, there are some other number fields. It's not known in general. But uh, this is a good sign that, indeed, we get jumping primes. Now, uh, a recent result of Francois Charles is that uh, even when the curves are not isogenous to elliptic curves, nevertheless, the set of jumping primes is infinite. So this is a great uh, uh, theorem that uh, I'm sure you know, can be generalized further. And um, uh, it uh, well, combines equidistribution, combines, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a beautiful paper. Now, if the surface, though, is absolutely simple, not isogenous to a product of two elliptic curves, then we still don't have a uh, theorem about jumping primes. And uh, I think this is sort of the next case that, that could be addressed. All right. So if you don't know this in theory, we can look at uh, what happens in practice. Uh, uh, we can look at the proportion of the jumping primes. So take all the primes and take the jumping primes, and let's see what happens. Now, uh, so this is what happens. Uh, my uh, student, Edgar Costa, who's graduating this year, uh, he uh, implemented uh, a version of Kidlias algorithm for counting uh, points over finite fields. So Kidlias uh, original papers dealt with uh, hyperelliptic curves uh, of small genus. But uh, uh, you know, Edgar was able to overcome difficulties that you have implementing with for surfaces. In any event, uh, he was able to extend the search from primes less than 10 to primes less than 100,000, which is you know, a big improvement and allows you to you know, get some uh, statistics on those uh, jumping behaviors. And so what we see is that uh, uh, when rank Picard is 1, uh, then the so proportion of jumping primes is essentially c over square root of b, where b is a bound. Uh, well, it's, you know, you, you see what you see. So these are the plots 
of these numbers. Now, what happens in rank Picard 2? In rank Picard 2, it's a completely different behavior. There is no square root of b. What we are seeing is a slow convergence to one half. Uh, we don't really have an explanation for any of that, but we have lots of other examples in, in higher ranks and, and so on and so on and so on. No, so this is rank Picard 1 geometric. And uh, and also no yeah yeah so okay so these are the experiments and this is rank Picard two so these are not definitely not commerce these are so, so, so half, half, of, half of the primes half of the primes yeah so uh, well we're jumping from two to four right yeah. so this is what you get. Uh, now of course if you do an analytic number theory you don't really see uh, let's say Dirichlet characters, you're usually jumping up and down the one half. You don't actually approach from, uh, uh, well, anyway. I mean, this is not your typical square root of D thing. But, uh, well, it's only up to 100,000 primes. Uh, in any event, so why are we so focused on the strength Picard 2? Well, because of some geometric application in the background. Uh, assume that this uh, jumping set is infinite for K3 surfaces, also number fields with uh, Picaring 2 and 4. If you're in 2, you jump to 4. If you're in 4, you jump to 6. Yeah. Uh, then, in fact, every K3 surface over any algebraically closed field, not necessarily number field, uh, algebraic numbers, contains infinitely many rational curves. So this is a combination of uh, the first result was Ogomolov, Hassett, and myself dealing with case series of uh, degree 2, and then an extension of uh, that technique by Lee Lidke to deal with you know, any degree. And uh, so the theorem is if you're an odd Picard rank, then, uh, well, you use the fact that you're jumping, and then you get extra curves, and then you can lift some combinations of these curves to characteristic 0. And those rational curves, uh, well, they're different, and uh, and uh, if you are in other Picard ranks, well, then you get elliptic vibrations or automorphisms, and those structures can be used to produce many rational curves. So, uh, therefore, rank Picard 2 is kind of crucial for us now. Now. The case, sorry? The whole case rank Picard 4, then you only need to jump. There are only finitely many lattices. Yeah. yeah, there are only finitely many exceptions in rank Picard 4, so yeah. we can just focus on rank Picard 2 for all practical purposes. So, so that was that. Now, so we kind of understand case threes, or at least have seen some problems concerning you know, arithmetic of case threes. So I want to talk about uh, holomorphic symplectic fourfolds. Uh, well, uh, you know, Hilbert's scheme of two points on a case three. You know, s times s over the action, and then resolves the singularity, the diagonal. So you get something called holomorphic uh, symplectic variety. Uh, and this is the main example, but you can also look at the formations of those. Now, the beautiful thing about these varieties is that not only can you intersect divisors and curves, you can also intersect uh, uh, divisors and divisors and curves and curves. There is a quadratic form uh, on H2, the Bovil uh, Bogomolov intersection form, and it's quite explicit. I mean, if we start with the K3, well, then we have, of course, a quadratic form, the intersection on the K3. And then there is this extra class, the class of the diagonal, and well, it's orthogonal to the rest, and the square is minus two. Boom. So we know what that uh, lattice is. Now, of course, we also have the curve classes, and then we have a duality divided as curve, so we get a form on the h lower two as well, quadratic form. Now, uh, some years ago, Brendan and I were looking at uh, um, these varieties, uh, uh, we were interested in the description of uh, the cone of ample divisors, or you know, effective curves uh, on these fourfolds. And so we put forward some preliminary conjecture, so let's say effective curves conjecture. So your effective uh, curve, if well, you're intersecting the polarization positively, and if the square is bigger equal than minus 5 over 2. We've seen that for case threes, the inequality was bigger or equal than minus two. So here we ran into minus five over two. I'll tell you a little bit later about the history of this, but then you can ask, 
All right. So what happens if you have, let's say, divisor class on the boundary of this cone that we describe in terms of this quadratic form? Well, the inequality that I wrote down here allows for uh, the following um, classes. You can, cl you can have a class of square 0, a class of square minus 2, and a class of square minus 10. And, uh, well, you've got all kinds of examples. Now, a class of square 0 on the boundary, well, that's uh, an analog of an elliptic vibration on a case 3. It's going to be an abelian surface vibration. And, uh, well, there's been a lot of activity uh, you know, towards the proof of this conjecture. So it's necessarily over P2. And uh, uh, there's a recent paper by Markman proving this um, uh, for almost all uh, such F, uh, there are some technical assumptions, and then Byron McCree for moduli spaces, you know, things like Hilbert schemes of the points directly, not deformations. So, uh, all right, so square zero classes we understand. Now, what about the other classes? L minus two class, well, uh, there's going to be some divisor that's going to get attracted. So, what's this divisor? Well, it's a family of P1s over a K3 surface. And it gets blown down to some double. And the minus 10 class, it corresponds to actually a family of lines contained in a P2. And the P2 gets contracted to a point. So that's a geometry that sort of emerged as we started looking at this. And uh, uh, well, then there was some work towards proving this. And uh, in 2008, uh, we were able to show that what you conjecture to be the ample cone, the cone dual to the cone of effective curves, is well at least as large as we had conjectured you know, nine years prior. Now that relied on all kinds of results. I mean, it relied on the middle, of the progress in the minimal model program, Berger, Cassini, Haken, McKernan, some results of Buxon, and then uh, a little bit later, you know, important ingredient came in, namely the Torelli theorem by Verbitsky for these holomorphic symplectic varieties, and that allowed us to prove that the ample cone is at most as large as we had predicted. And uh, so in addition to Torelli, we also needed the results of Markman uh, concerning monodromy. We needed to understand uh, computation of the monodromy group. Uh, that was very essential for us. Now, where is it coming from? Well, uh, if we start with a cubic fourfold that was mentioned in yesterday's talk several times and is uh, just a beautiful uh, topic in geometry to begin with and arithmetic, you know, cubic fourfolds. Uh, and we look at its uh, variety of lines, then uh, it is actually a deformation of uh, HILP2 of a K3. So this is the result of Puvil and Danagi from 85. And uh, there is this interplay between the geometry of a cubic fourfold uh, and the geometry of certain surfaces, P2 or scrolls, uh, and uh, well, that holomorphic symplectic variety. That is uh, important. So now, uh, let me start with some example, and then I'll you know, talk a little bit more generally. So assume that our uh, uh, cubic fourfold contains a cubic scroll, or a hyperplane section, which is special sort of the six double points. You know, it may happen that you take some hyperplane section, you get a cubic threefold, and then you just force six double points points on that. But you, allow, I mean, you want them in general position. So then you can analyze the variety of lines on this cubic uh, threefold. And then it turns out that it actually has three components. Uh, there's a cubic surface, and then there are two planes, and they're glued in some strange ways. And we analyzed that in great detail with Brendan. So uh, well, uh, we have this Bavil Bogomolo form on uh, the Picard of the holomorphic symplectic variety, the variety of lines. And uh, well, I just wrote down the form. Picard has rank two, and this is the form. And why did we pick you know, this particular example and this particular scroll? Well, we picked it because uh, you see, I said there are square zero classes, there are square minus two classes, and there are square minus 10 classes. And we wanted a lattice that doesn't represent 0 and doesn't represent minus 2. So the lattice that I wrote down represents minus 10. And so you wanted to understand, well, what happens to the birational geometry if 
you have just that minus 10 class. What does it mean? So you have this Lagrangian P2. Now, all right, so the lattice represents minus 10, and I wrote down some vectors that do that. And then uh, using our conjectures, if you like, that we proved in this particular case, uh, we can compute uh, the cones. And uh, well, so here are the cones. So this is the picture. Uh, there are actually two birational models uh, we found. And uh, well, the effective cone is partitioned into ample cones for these models. And for the first time you see it, you say, oh, maybe there are infinitely many uh, birational models. But no, as you jump from chamber to chamber, you go from here, jump with a different model to here, you get an isomorphic uh, fourfold. So well, that's, that's a picture that emerges sort of uh, geomet I mean, geometrically just by looking at you know, lattices and cones. And uh, uh, well, why would you do this? Well, we were inspired by a result of uh, Claire. Namely, if you look at a cubic fourfold, and um, again, it's a variety of lines, there is actually a non-trivial rational self-map from F, the variety of lines, to itself of high degree, which goes like this. So you pick a line, uh, which is a point on your uh, variety of lines, but a line on the cubic fourfold. Then there is a unique plane that's uh, tangent to the fourfold along this line. Then you look at the residual, you get another line. So you get from line L, you get to a different line L prime. And then you can try to see uh, what happens when you iterate this construction. You know, what's the orbit of you know, a point under this map? And so uh, in, uh, I guess, uh, uh, American Campana first uh, proved that, um, um, that if you pick a general point, it's very general, it's over the complex numbers, and you iterate this thing, then uh, the orbit will become the risky dense. I mean, that's great over complex numbers. Already you get kind of an interesting dynamical system, but uh, over uh, a number field, it's uh, not that useful because very general will exclude you know, algebraic points, and that's not so interesting. And uh, you know, American uh, Claire proves that actually you can do it over number fields. There exist uh, varieties over uh, Q bar. Uh, with uh, rank picar one and uh, a dense set, you know, potentially dense set of rational points. You pick some number field, which is very interesting because uh, for K3 surfaces, we don't know that. If you have a K3 of rank picar one, we don't know that rational points will be dense after some finite extension of the ground field. And that, of course, is you know, a big open problem. Uh, we just don't have enough geometry to play with. But here, even though you have rank picar one, still there is some kind of geometry in the background that allows you to uh, move around the rational points. Now, uh, so why do I mention this? Because uh, the variety that Brennan and I looked at, it doesn't have rank picar one. Indeed, we insisted that we have this particular scroll in our cubic fourfold. So the rank picar is two. We have an extra algebraic class. Uh, well, nevertheless. Uh, we could show using uh, those birational maps that uh, are suggested by the partition of uh, the effective cone, as I wrote down, uh, to uh, move around uh, rational points. So the picture is as follows. So the corresponding final variety of lines, well, it has rank picar 2, if you assume some generality, which you can test, actually, over a number field. And uh, well, the automorphisms will be trivial, but uh, uh, f will not be birational to any abelian vibration. There are no square zero classes. That's how we picked the lattice. But the birational automorphisms are infinite. In fact, in fact, it's an infinite dihedral group. And uh, those birational automorphisms allow us to move around rational points and prove the risky density of rational points in this case. So. Um, this geometry of the cubic fourfold and you know interaction with a variety of lines, um, well, I mean this is what led us to the original conjecture with minus five over two, and uh, you know the structure of the cone. But uh, 
uh, it can also be used successfully for the other problem that I mentioned, namely computing the unabstracted subset of the Adels. So here is a construction, a geometric construction. You start as a polarized K3, let's say rank pick R1, you just write it down, uh, and uh, you pick uh, some element on the Brow group, I guess, and uh, uh, there is a construction of a cubic fourfold so that its variety of lines is the formation equivalent to this particular S2. But uh, uh, moreover, they're all deformation, but the formation equivalent okay, to this S2. Not to, not to some K3, but to this particular. Well, I guess, um, yeah. Um, but what I wanted to say is that for this, uh, in this example, the, so here is the lattice, uh, that uh, you find this minus 2 class with a divisorial contraction so that uh, your variety of lines contains uh, a conic bundle over this surface as a divisor that gets contract contracted by this minus 2. I guess, that, I guess that's what I wanted to say. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, you look at these lattices here, you find your minus 2 class. Here is a minus 2 class with tau. Uh, and, uh, and uh, well, you get the conic bundle. Now, why would we be interested in a conic bundle? Because the conic bundle, that's the realization of your Atsumai algebra, of your two torsion class, in geometrically inside this variety. So, uh, how is it used? Well, so Brendan and uh, Tony Varela Alvarado, they looked at a specific example, degree 2K3. Uh, well, you, I guess you need something of degree 6. So this is of degree 6. These are quadric polynomials. And uh, uh, implemented this, relating, uh, uh, I mean, producing explicitly that conic bundle over that K3 using this construction. And then, uh, you know, they picked coefficients and uh, showed that the corresponding K3 had rank pick R1, and uh, they could get examples of failure of Hasse principle and also weak approximation. So, um, okay. Now, this was one application. If you know, um, you know this kind of lattice theory, and you can you know, combine it with this explicit geometry. Another application is uh, if you have a rational curve in the variety of lines, it will translate to, well, a scroll, a surface of rational, I mean, a family of P1s parametrized by this rational curve in the cubic fourfold, a scroll. Now you can compute the degrees, uh, and uh, uh, you can try to use these extra classes for some geometric construction. For example, for unirational parametrization. So uh, we already saw, I guess, yesterday, if you have a cubic fourfold with a plane, uh, or a cubic fourfold with you know, something else, then you can produce maybe a rational um, you get rational varieties this way. But uh, uh, you can try projecting, you can try using scrolls. In any event, you can compute the degrees of what you have. And, uh, well, you get some numbers. And uh, the bottom line is that when you look at these numbers, you realize that you can get uh, cubic fourfolds with uh, co prime. This unirational parameterizations that are co-prime. In particular, you can get cubic fourfolds with odd degree unirational parameterizations. Now, why is that interesting? Because, well, even degree is not so exciting. You can get it sort of immediately. But odd degree is interesting. And then, um, if you think about uh, obstructions to something, you know, rationality or something else, using, um, you know, maybe cycles or degrees of cycles, you won't uh, be able to proceed because. Uh, um, because of his coprimality. All right. Uh, so we were, of course, interested in new rationality constructions. So we were interested in finding scrolls where this degree that I wrote down uh, would be 1. Well, how do you get it to be 1? So here is some square here. And so here is some self-intersection of a rational curve. So you would want this to be as negative as possible. And then we started tabulating what kind of classes R can you get. And then you write you know, many, many examples. 
Now, how do you analyze these examples? As I said, you need to look at some rational surfaces and cubic fourfolds. Well, there are some constraints, there are bizu type constraints as to what you can have. And then you look and look and look, and you, know, you have points and points and points, and you see a wall. You can't get through. You can't get more negative than something. And then you see with something, it sort of begins to line up, and then you see minus 5 over 2. And that was, that was sort of the origin of the conjecture, that we really tried very hard to get rational parameterizations, to get this to be as negative as possible. And you can't. I mean, I'm not saying that you don't have new rational parameterizations. It's just that we looked at small discriminants. We looked at many, 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 I mean, you can look at the paper, but there's actually a huge file outside the paper. Uh, so, uh, so that was a conjecture. That's where it was coming from. Now, so once you kind of understand fourfolds, uh, we can try to look at uh, higher dimensions, holomorphic symplectic varieties of uh, K3 types, the formation equivalent to help n of a K3. And again, there is a beville bogomolov form uh, where you, know, you have the K3 still appearing as part of it, and then there is this delta. And now the square of delta is not uh, minus 2, what it was before, but minus 2 times n minus 1. Uh, and uh, there is a foundational result which says that if uh, this uh, quadratic form, well, if there is a class of positive square, then it's a projective variety. OK. So then you can hope, well, maybe uh, the quadratic form on, on, on the Picard lattice it will determine the ample and effective cone the way it happened for uh, K3s and the way, well, it happened uh, for HILP2 of K3s. Maybe this is, this is it. So then we started, again, collecting uh, all kinds of examples in higher dimensions. And uh, instead of minus 5 over 2, uh, we found minus n plus 3 over 2 as being sort of the most negative class that we were able to obtain. So therefore, the initial conjecture that emerged was if you have a polarized holomorphic symplectic variety, then uh, an effective curve is something that intersects the polarization positively and uh, whose uh, square is bounded by minus n plus 3 over 2. Right. For n is 1 is the minus 2 that you saw before, then minus 5 over 2, then maybe that. So, uh, well, uh, it was hard to sort of analyze this and prove it in higher dimensions, apart from examples. But there were some major breakthroughs in rational geometry, uh, analyzing, uh, uh, let's say, effective cones of Hilbert schemes of points on the Delpezzo surface, like P2, and also um, you know, subsequent work on uh, K3s. Uh, uh, and the new ingredient was, well, this. Uh, you know, derived category, stability conditions, and analysis of uh, these stability conditions, uh, and uh, uh, building on breakthrough work by Bayer and McCree in the case of SN, Hilbert schemes of n points of K3s, so and a little bit more general, building on Markman's monodromy and also the Torello theorem. Uh, we have this theorem, joint work with um, Bayer, Brendan, and myself, is that we actually have a complete description of the cone of ample divisors and all the other cones, moving you know, all of these cones on holomorphic symplectic varieties of K3N type for all N. Uh, so it's not just a description, we have a theorem. So this is what it is. Now, uh, what we learned from this is that, in fact, the original conjecture holds not only for N equals 2, but also N equals 3. But it may fail uh, for N bigger equal than uh, 4. So the original conjecture was that the most negative class is with minus n plus 3 over 2. And I should also say that Mongardi uh, proved uh, you know, inclusion of um, the Morricon into what's predicted around the same time we had our full theorem. Now, what is the new insight? What's different? Uh, the new insight was that to understand these cones, it doesn't suffice to look at the Picard lattice by itself, actually. So one has to look at the slightly bigger lattice. Uh, there is sort of a natural extension. Uh, and uh, well, there is sort of an extra class. There is some primitive vector there. And uh, in the example that we look at, 
Uh, you see, the originally, if you look at the holomorphic symplectic variety, uh, you see H2 of S plus Z. You remember that was Z delta. There was one extra class that needed to be added. Well, for the correct description, you actually need uh, an additional class. So, well, this class V. And uh, uh, th so that's the lattice that you need to analyze. And uh, the conjecture is phrased in terms of this lattice. And again, it's based on uh, a Torelli that's in the background, that if you have some Hodge isometry of these extended lattices and using an isomorphism on the H2s of uh, the K3s, then, uh, in fact, uh, you know, your varieties F and F prime are birational, homomorphic symplectic varieties. Now, so just more notation, there is this extended lattice. There is some canonical homomorphism from this lattice into lower H2. And you know, upper H2 embeds into lower H2. We have these pairings and uh, the lattices. And so finally, uh, I can tell you what the conjecture is. So the Mori cone, the cone of effective curves, of course generated by classes as positive square, and images under this theta check of uh, sort of algebraic classes, one one classes in this extended lattice, with square bigger equals and minus two, which uh, intersect with this distinguished vector v um, in this form, and which are also positive on the polarization. Now it's a little bit hard to digest, especially the first time you see it, even after a long time at looking at this, you know, why this and how does this come about? It's sort of this very, very detailed analysis in the Bayer McCree paper of what happens, you know, stability conditions, what happens. Sorry? Your extra class is algebraic? Or? Uh, the extra class, uh, um, let's see. So the, the extra class V, um, you're on, I think it's algebraic. All right, so uh, R, R, uh, minus N plus three over, t uh, anyway, you still get this inequality. You still get this inequality and uh, uh, now you want to understand what are these uh, uh, rational curves. All right. So uh, to get some geometric understanding similar to what we saw for HILP2, uh, remember there was square 0, square minus 2, square minus 10. We need uh, um, some, some toy model to play with. And uh, well, we have, of course, the monodromy. We can look at you know, what happens as you start uh, kind of deforming, if you get a family, what happens to your classes. And the first result in this direction is that actually, uh, given a class with negative square in this range, you can cook up a K3 surface, an honest K3 surface uh, of rank Picard 1, and uh, some extremal rational curve, or P1, in uh, HILP N, on the nose, HILP N of that K3, so that that class will be monodromy equivalent to whatever you're looking at. So in other words, so this lemma kind of allows us to reduce the study of these extremal classes on random, I mean, arbitrary holomorphic symplectic varieties to, uh, you know, K3s and uh, uh, well, HILP N with rank Picard 2. Okay, so the Mori cone here will be generated by this uh, uh, delta check and this, this particular class that we look at. Now, uh, so for example, you would want to understand the most extremal ones, the minus n plus 3 over 2 classes. Uh, or geometrically, if you don't know that a priori, you would look at Lagrangian PNs and you would look at classes of lines in, uh, in those Lagrangian PNs. And uh, well, we did it by hand using nothing, just uh, you know, homology ring computation. We did it for n equals two. Well, that was easy that I showed you kind of. But for n equals three, uh, the computation, the identification of the number, the sort of the square of uh, a line in uh, Lagrangian P3 in this case led to uh, the following equation. It's an elliptic curve, and we needed to find integral points on this elliptic curve. And the only solution uh, there is is exactly 
what uh, we predicted. Um, so this minus 48 is sort of, it's this minus 6 class that shows up there. Now, proving, I mean, we got this equation, and then we had to show that there is only this one solution. Proving this, well, it's sort of descent on elliptic curves, integral points on elliptic curves, it wasn't straightforward. But uh, even less straightforward was the next computation done by Bakker and Georgia, uh, where for n equals 4, again, uh, you're led to some elliptic curve. You know, there are all these coefficients, they have something to do, there is this quadratic Google Bogomolo form, that, you know, other things that spit out this. And again, you needed to show that uh, there's only one integral point on this curve. And that one integral point gave us exactly the class that we had conjectured in this case, minus 7 over 2. It's a complete miracle. I mean, I have no idea why you know, elliptic curves show up in, in, first of all, in these rings. And, but clearly, and you can tell from coefficients, that wasn't the right approach to identify those classes. So uh, the right approach was uh, uh, done by Bakker using, again, the stability conditions and the work of Byron McCree. And so his theorem is that if you have a class of a line on Lagrangian Pn, then it's squared as minus n plus 3 over 2. And uh, 2 times the class is actually in h upper 2. And uh, if you have uh, a primitive class that generates an extreme array of the Morricone, uh, if it satisfies these numerics, then it has to be the class of a line on Lagrangian Pn. And moreover, there is only one, there is a single monodromy orbit for that. The problem is that it's not a complete answer yet, because you can have not non-primitive classes. I mean, you can have, I mean, there are other sources of these lines on Lagrangian Pn, so it's not completely settled yet, but at least these are sort of sufficient conditions. So that's that. But we are also interested in the other, uh, sort of, in the, in the geometry of the other extremal rays. And so here is, again, a recollection of what happens for HILP2. So you have this P1 bundle over S, you have the P2. And uh, uh, so here is what happens for HILP3. Uh, well, this is a Lagrangian P3 that I mentioned. This is a minus, you know. So this is phrased in terms of A's and V's, of so these actors A's and V's. Uh, but you also get P1 bundles over product of S with itself, or product of S with some isogenous uh, K3 surface, P2 bundle over S, P1 bundles over S2. Uh, and when I say over S2, uh, well, uh, I mean, this is what sort of lattice theory begins to spit out. Now, we did it for HILP4, and uh, we get it for HILP5, and those are the tables that you can generate. So why are we doing this? Well, uh, it allows us to uh, understand, you know, subtle questions in geometry. For example, automorphisms. Uh, you know, the description of the effective cone or the ample cone uh, in the theory of K3 surfaces, you know if you have sort of a lattice um, automorphism that preserves the cone, that it's really an automorphism of a K3. So here, you can get an example of a K3 of very large degree, so that HILP3 has an automorphism, but that doesn't come from any automorphism of uh, any K3. It really is new to HILP3. It's not coming from any surface T with uh, HILP3 of T equal to S3. And uh, uh, finally, the thing that sort of really shows that the original idea that maybe H2 and the quadratic form characterize uh, the cones, so here is a a uh, theorem that you can actually get holomorphic symplectic varieties uh, where you have an isomorphism of Hodge structures mapping one polarization to the other polarization but not preserving the ample cones. And, uh, well, we have an example for, you know, HILP7, for example. We can do that. Now, other applications, just briefly. So we would want these things to construct the Tsumaya algebras. Uh, you know, these P1 vibrations or Pn vibrations or Pr vibrations, you can make them twisted. You can get brouwer severi varieties over S, and that is useful for Hasse principle weak approximation. Then uh, 
you could try to construct isogenies between K3 surfaces explicitly. There is some recent work by McKinney, Savon, and Tanimoto, and Tony. Uh, you can try to describe derived equivalences geometrically, explicitly, using these exceptional um, loci. And again, as I showed you, you can analyze uh, birational and uh, regular automorphisms of holomorphic symplectic varieties. Now, in the last 10 minutes, uh, here is some more arithmetic work on, uh, let's say, derived equivalent case threes. So, uh, two case threes are derived equivalent if um, you have an isomorphism of transcendental lattices. But uh, in this way, you don't see that you can do it over a non closed field, for example, because it's like a transcendental. Uh, well, there's a way to say what derived equivalent uh, over a non closed field is. I mean, you want to have some equivalence of triangulated categories, and then you can look at things that are defined over your field. And uh, well, in high Picard rank, you don't get much because the derived equivalent K3 will be isomorphic. But in low Picard rank, in particular rank Picard 1 of main interest to us, or you can have uh, non isomorphic but derived equivalent K3s. So, uh, so here are some lattices in rank Picard 2. So these K3s are uh, derived equivalent. You can pick examples over a number field, over the rationals. Um, and well, you can ask, well, is there any relation between arithmetic? So the theorem is that, uh, well, first of all, both have zero cycles of degree 1. Uh, secondly, one of them has rational points always. The other one uh, has a potentially dense set of rational points over some extension of the ground field, no matter what the field is, well, the automorphism group is infinite, and then rational points will be dense. What we don't know is that the first one, which always has points over any field, has actually a dense set of points over some extension, some finite extension. And what we don't know is that the other one, which has potentially dense set of points, has points over the ground field. So. Those are the examples. Now, there is some structure that's uh, underlying all of this. Uh, well, if you look at these Picard lattices as Galois modules, they're actually sort of isomorphic. I mean, you don't get new invariants. So at least in terms of Galois theory and Galois representation, it's kind of the same. And the Brow groups are kind of the same, because Brow groups come from transcendental lattices, and they are supposed to be the same. And then there is sort of a separate thing that shows that, well, if one has a zero cycle of degree one, the other has a zero cycle of degree one. So this is all good news. Uh, then uh, we have another piece of good news, the result of Lieblich and Olson, that if you work over a finite field and you have derived equivalent K3s, then they have the same number of rational points. Well, that's great. Uh, then you can ask, well, what about the reals? OK. Uh, well, if you have derived equivalent K3s over the reals, then in fact, one has real points, the other has real points. It's also great. Now, what about p-addicts? What about the rationals? Now, we would hope, of course, that over the p-addicts, we have a similar story. And then, if you are very optimistic, the Brow groups are the same. If the p-addict points are also, if you have p-addict points here and there, it's the same. Well, you see the pairing Brow group with adelic points, that should also be kind of derived invariant. Well, then you could hope, well, if in one, the Brow and unobstructed adels are not empty, well, in the other, the Brow and unobstructed adels would also be non empty. And maybe that would force, you know, something like this over the rationals. That would be a wild dream. But uh, let's focus on the p-addicts first. So you can look at what happens to K3s when you. So you have over ZP, a special fiber. Uh, if the special fiber is not too bad, then in fact, if one has p-adic points, the other has p-adic points. Uh, and then you can ask, well, uh, is, for example, this potentially good reduction of derived invariant? And indeed, there are results in this direction, and also ADE reductions. There is some recent work that shows that at least this part of the picture is consistent. We can also look at the geometric case. Rather than looking at the p let's look at the punctured disk. So then, well, not every family of K3s over punctured disk, or over disk, 
will have uh, sections. So I, here is a K3, which there is no section. So the goal would be to show that uh, uh, having a section or not having a section is a draft invariant. And uh, well, so there is a theory of Kulikov models. Uh, you know, you can get you know central fibers of special form. You can get the K3. You can get the chain of uh, surfaces, uh, and you can get a union of rational surfaces. There are these three types: one, two, three. And so what we show is that if you are derived equivalent over C of t, and if one has a Kulikov model, then the other has a Kulikov model. And of course, if you have that, then both are non-empty. And moreover, the degree of the extension that you need to get to Kulikov model is also the same. So there's another example that was of interest to us. You can look at isotrivial families. You can simply look at um, uh, well isotrivial. So after some finite extension, isomorphic, and then you have a quotient by a finite group. So you have some finite groups, uh, and uh, you know that will be preserved under derived equivalence. And so the question that we ask, existence of these analytic sections, is essentially a question about fixed points for those uh, actions of finite groups. All right? OK, so we have a Z mod N, a cyclic group acting on a K3, and then we're going to twist by this action or by some, some smaller group. Uh, so that's the problem then. If we have some finite cyclic group acting on x0 and y0, uh, so that uh, you know we have an isomorphism of Hodge structures compatible with that cyclic action, uh, can you relate the fixed points uh, on these K3s? Okay. Uh, then you look at what kind of cyclic automorphisms you have. So this is the Euler function. Uh, it's known that all such things arise. And there is this uh, analysis symplectic, non-symplectic. So here are some numbers that you have to understand. I mean, this is just the orders of cyclic groups that you know, can happen. And then for each of those, you can sort of analyze the structure of fixed points. And you know, of course, just having the number you know, can have different actions. Uh, but Table. sorry? Uh, so these are all numbers, this Euler function less oh, equal than 20. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Just in case you were wondering how to write them down. So they're random numbers. Okay. They're not random. <laughs> <laughs> they're not that random because there's a huge literature. Well, what's the group as a column? Or is just uh, it's just a <laughs> good question. <laughs> but there's a huge literature <laughs> that analyzes and answers partly the question that you're asking, namely, uh, other case threes with an automorphism of order 17, 13, you know, write down models, uh, what kind of actions can you have. Um, it's, it's a norm. I had no idea actually before walking into this. But, uh, but what I can see is that whichever number we pick in this table and start focusing and completely untangling actions and fixed points, and of course, you know, there are long papers because the fixed points are very different. I mean, well, anyway doable but so hopefully all the information that we need is in this <coughs> table of random numbers but um, uh, the, I, I think the correct answer would be there has to be a better reason and there has to be a better proof uh, um, than just matching you know case by case uh, and so what we would like to I mean what I think is left to do is some kind of mixed characteristic version of Kulikov models a mixed characteristic version of this Fourier Mukai transforms for K3 vibrations. You see, we have family of K3s, let's say, over the piatics, and then we would like to understand well, is there still a Fourier Mukai in the general fiber? How does it specialize? What happens? And uh, so, just in conclusion, last minute, so what have we learned? The birational geometry of his puncture schemes is very rich, and there are some recent breakthroughs that um, open the door to interesting applications in arithmetic geometry. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks, comments. Okay, uh, this project, like, uh, uh, better, uh, yeah. uh, the second of the uh, line, uh, like, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, states, uh, yeah. Of course. So, it's just no. It's K three type. Yeah. K3 type. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is the idea? 
Uh, he he looks at those he, he looks at the paper of the biomimicry paper, and looks at um, I mean there is some kind of analysis of what's there, and um, how would I characterize this? This is uh, a well a detailed analysis of what's in the biomimicry paper, yeah. but there is some work to be done. He really and the and the that you you Yes. Oh, yes. So we look at monodromy. So we have this monodromy group, this big orthogonal group acting, and we look at these things at representations. So the idea was that, well, you have this thing, you deform it, and you use Torelli, you deform it in such a way that very few classes are left, and then you start with computation. And uh, well, you know, you have some conditions, uh, normal bundles, and so on and so on. You write down something, but it's underdetermined. So in the end, you, you get this. There is some algebra. I don't know why these cubic equations show up. For help two, it's much easier, but for help three, this is okay. working out. But I should also say that we analyzed this in the Kummer case. Um, all right. So in the Kummer case, the four-dimensional Kummer case. There are actually several monodromy orbits already there. I mean, we were thinking that's only one monodromy orbit for this Lagrangian PNs. And this is almost true. Not quite, but almost true. But in the Comer case, it's not. And there are many different orbits. And, well, anyway, maybe 81. I mean, it's, it's very strange. But we were able to pin, the, pin it down. Completely. So we have a complete answer, complete characterization of Lagrangian P2s in the common fourfold case. Any other question? Okay, let's continue again.